Good evening, everybody. I'm excited to be with you. My name is Jared Peatman. I'm a historian by training. Um, and when I did my undergraduate work, as well as my graduate work in history, I focused on the Gettysburg Address. Um, and so I, I realized quickly the only way to get through a grad program somewhat expeditiously is to do the same topic and just keep expanding it. So I started with the Gettysburg Address as an undergrad and then worked on it uh, for my master's and then for my my dissertation as well. And so that's what I'm going to share a little bit with you tonight. Um, and then eventually all of that work would become my my first book, which you see the cover of that on the on the screen as I speak here. And so what I was interested in looking at with this topic is how the speech has been interpreted and invoked over the last 160 years now since it was delivered. And by that, uh, what I mean is starting off with all the way in 1863. So what are some of the contemporary reactions to the speech? What are the ways that it was used even at that time? All the way up through 1963. And there's a reason that I picked that year in particular. It's not just the round number of it being that first century. So I wrote the dissertation. Uh, it was it was fine. I passed. That was a good thing. Um, and I sent the manuscript off to the publisher. And the publisher said, yeah, it, it's good. We like it. We'll take it but we want you to bring it up to the present. And they asked for a whole nother chapter. And I said, I don't know about writing a whole nother chapter at this point. I was I was kind of ready to be done. And I said, well, how about I write a, an epilogue, a short epilogue? And they agreed to that. And I added this stipulation, but if I write an epilogue, I'm gonna talk about the Vampire Hunter movie because it had just come out. And so if you do pick up a copy and read my book, you will read the last two pages are all about the Vampire Hunter movie and how it has the most accurate Gettysburg Address scene of all time. So I don't know what that tells you about other Hollywood movies that cover Lincoln, but, but such is the case. So um, in more detail, what I look at throughout the course of the book are different eras, um, eras of particular importance. So right after the speech was delivered, 1863, what were the responses, the contemporary responses at the time? What were the responses as we move forward into the early 1900s, the progressive era um, sort of capped on the back end by 1922 and the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial, which, of course, has the Gettysburg Address inscribed on the wall. Um, the next chapter looks at the era of the World Wars, World War I and World War II. How was the Gettysburg Address used during wartime? And then the last chapter, in some ways, I think the most interesting, covers this time period from 1959 until 1965. And so you have four things happening sort of concurrently that impact on the speech. You have the Lincoln birth sesquicentennial, you have the Civil War centennial, but then underneath all of that, you have the Cold War and you have the Civil Rights Movement. So how was the speech being used at that time um, by people across the, the spectrum? I was interested both in domestic responses as well as the international responses throughout these time periods. And in some ways, the international angle is some of the most interesting stuff, some of the most perhaps surprising stuff that that we would see. Um, here's just one example. This is the French Constitution from 1958 that you see on the screen now. Um, it's the fifth constitution that they have written throughout their history. It's the one that's still in effect today. And if you're able to make out the writing on that very last line, you'll see that it says, Son Principle A, government to people, parla people, a poor the people, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. This comes from the Gettysburg Address. Um, and it's somewhat shocking today. You know, France is a country that we don't always have the best relationships with. And yet, their constitution based on this principle of government of, by, and for the people going back to, to Abraham Lincoln. So a lot of people have been interested in, in um, the ideas that went into the Gettysburg Address. So if you think about Gary Will's famous book, Lincoln at Gettysburg from the 1990s, he's interested about the impact of the, the Greeks and, you know, these ancient sort of orders on Lincoln's style. Other people have looked at the words in particular, a uh, fantastic book that came out the same year as mine. Martin Johnson looked at actually writing the Gettysburg Address and how Lincoln went about that. Um, but not many people have looked at the ideas that came out of the Gettysburg Address most of those books covered it in just a couple of pages. And so that sort of longer term impact is what I was interested in. My argument in short is that Lincoln meant the Gettysburg Address as his most eloquent statement that a democracy could only persist if it placed equality at its core. But when you looked at the reactions to the speech for 99 years, people talked about the speech 
because it was eloquent. They held it up as a great example of, of writing. Or they talked about the speech because it said some great things about democracy. Or they talked about the speech because it said something about equality. But they never really combined all three in the way that Lincoln intended. And so my argument is that for the first almost century, that Lincoln's true purpose is, is sort of lost. You know, his intent of the full message he meant to deliver at Gettysburg doesn't get through until we move into the 1960s. So before we get to that piece, though, you know, let me sort of make this argument a little bit more on what exactly it was that Lincoln was was trying to do here in Gettysburg, right? Just how important he viewed this opportunity. And the first thing, you know, there's a few controversies that I tried to address um, in the course of my book. And one is, when was Lincoln asked? When was Lincoln invited to Gettysburg? I think this is important because if Lincoln is an afterthought, and if Lincoln only accepts the invitation to Gettysburg two and a half weeks before the speech, which is traditionally what folks have said, then you know it's it maybe is an afterthought on the part of the organizers. The thoughts at Gettysburg are maybe thrown together, as has often been indicated in in previous writings. But it turns out that's just not the case. So there's some evidence that comes from newspapers at the time. Uh, on October 13th, the Philadelphia Inquirer wrote that Lincoln was quote, expected to perform the consecrational service at the cemetery's dedication. And two days later, Gettysburg, one of Gettysburg's local papers, the Star and Banner, wrote, President Lincoln will also be present and participate in the ceremonies. And so this tells us that Lincoln was not asked on November 2nd in that short little note from David Wills, long after all the plans had been put in place. It tells us he was asked earlier than that, that the plans were already in the works. And there's a piece of circumstantial evidence as to when it was possible Lincoln was asked. And that circumstantial evidence is that on August 28th, Pennsylvania Governor Andrew Curtin would actually visit Lincoln in Washington, D.C. Um, and the descriptions of the things they talked about that day are, are very sort of general. But some of the lines at least lead to the possibility that speaking at Gettysburg was one of the things that Curtin was encouraging Lincoln to do. Now, Curtin's one of the main drivers behind the cemetery in Gettysburg. It's his efforts in July that will lead to the creation of the cemetery. He arrives there just four days after the battle's over. He appoints a local commissioner to care for Pennsylvania's fallen sons. And he quickly tells that commissioner, a local man named David Wills, to um, turn your attention to the dedication ceremonies. And so it certainly seems likely that Curtin, when he visited with Lincoln August 28th, might have extended that invitation. If you think about how protocol works in those days, you don't send a blind note to the president saying, you know, will you do this? The fix already has to be in. This is just sort of the formalized thing. This is the method they go through when they invite Edward Everett to be the main speaker. The mayor of Boston actually approached Everett first, got Everett's commitment to be the speaker, and then they followed up with the formal invitation afterwards. Last thing you want is somebody turning down the invitation. So I think Lincoln knows by the late summer that he is going to be speaking at, at Gettysburg. And the fact that he accepted is extraordinary. He only leaves Washington, D.C. about a dozen times during the war. Every other time is to meet with the generals, review the troops, uh, participate in fundraising efforts for the widows and the orphans of the battlefield. This is really the one exception. And so why is it that Lincoln is willing to leave D.C. for 25 hours, spend 12 hours on a train to deliver a speech that lasts for just two minutes? And it's because at this midway point of the war, Lincoln feels like the people of the nation are ready to hear a different message, one that he has had internal for a long time, but one that he hasn't felt like the nation is ready to share yet. For two years, Lincoln has been saying, we're just fighting to go back to what we had before. We're just fighting to go back to what we had in 1860 to return to that sort of antebellum status quo. But at Gettysburg, he says, of course, we want to go in a different direction, not just back to what we had before, but a new nation, a nation that does not have slavery. And more than that, a nation that is placed equality at its core. If you look at how the Gettysburg Address is laid out, it's three paragraphs, and it's past, present, and future. And Lincoln's argument is that to justify the sacrifice of the present, we have to have a better future. And if we want to have a better future, we need to remember where we came from in the first place.
So you all know the line, the, the opening line of the Gettysburg Address, four score and seven years ago. But I'm curious whether you've ever done the math or not. If you do the math, Lincoln is taking us back to 1776. Lincoln is positing that this is sort of the birth of the nation, right? This is that founding moment for the nation. And that's really important. Lincoln is a lawyer. You know, everything that Lincoln has done in his, his private life, his professional life has been based on the Constitution, which of course comes to that in 1787. But what Lincoln is saying at Gettysburg is we make a mistake if we only focus on the Constitution. The Constitution never says the word slavery, but it references the institution 11 times. And 10 of the 11 do things to protect, preserve, strengthen the institution of slavery. It's a compromise. What Lincoln is saying is if we want to have a better future, we need to remember our first principle, our founding principle from the Declaration that all men are created equal. That's what Lincoln believes. We began with this wonderful vision, but we've lost our way over time. The Constitution's a compromise, 1820, 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and that is what has ended us up in this mess that we are, are now in. In 1861, Lincoln had said, that the declaration gave promise that in due time the weight should be lifted from the shoulders of all men and that all should have an equal chance. In 1855, he had written to his best friend Joshua Speed, as a nation, we began by declaring that all men are created equal. We now practically read it, all men are created equal except Negroes. When the know-nothings get control, this is a nativist party at the time, it will read all men are created equal except Negroes and foreigners and Catholics. When it comes to this, I should prefer emigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving liberty to Russia, for instance, where despotism can be taken pure and without the base alloy of hypocrisy. So this is Lincoln's belief, this idea that our founding principles are in the Declaration. But again, for the first two years of the war, it's been all about restoration of the Union back to what we had before. At Gettysburg, he is sharing this much broader sense, his vision, essentially, of what the country should look like going forward. In fact, there's an argument you can make. This is the beginning of Reconstruction, the beginning of Lincoln's view of what the nation should look like in the aftermath of the Civil War. This is why he's come to Gettysburg. He starts writing the speech a few weeks out, a few weeks in advance, sort of as he wrote most things, sort of scraps of paper and pieces here and there. Um, the first page is written on Executive Mansion stationery. He does um, probably have a full draft written before he arrives in, in Gettysburg. He arrives in Gettysburg on November 18th um, and will spend the night at the house of David Wills, the man who's done all of the organizing. There are about three dozen house guests that are there. That night, Lincoln's the only person that actually got a bed to himself in the Wills house. Everybody else is sleeping with, with multiple people. One bed with several young women collapsed, broke in the middle of the night. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, I think it's important to remember that the Gettysburg Address is not just a, a speech on paper. It's an event as well. It's an event with perhaps 15,000 people that have come to this town. So on the night of the 18th, uh, before he would deliver the speech, Lincoln is serenaded from the town square. And Lincoln goes out to address the people. Um, accounts sort of vary whether he stood in the door, or hung out a window, whatever it may be. But he essentially says, it's really important that I don't say silly things. And fearing that's my condition tonight, I'm not going to say much to you. I'll address you all tomorrow. Well, some Southern newspapers report this as the Gettysburg Address. And they talk about how silly his comments were. He makes jokes. He's inappropriate. This is why I would suggest you have to take all reactions to the speech with a little bit of a grain of salt. We can see it right here. We know that the next morning, November 19th, Lincoln wakes up very early and he goes on a tour of the battlefield. He goes on a carriage tour of the battlefield. I mentioned Martin Johnson earlier in his fantastic work on the speech. Um, he suggests that the place where Lincoln visits is on the first day's battlefield where John Reynolds was mortally wounded, a, a man that Lincoln knew, that Lincoln had offered the command of the army to um, earlier that summer. And he's so touched by this, he's so impacted by this, that he returns to the Wills house. He asks for some paper. He rips off the second page that he'd already finished, and he re rewrites the second page of the Gettysburg Address. Three times on that page, he talks about the things they did here. He's now in Gettysburg. You know, he's talking about what they did here in this town. 
He's no longer sitting in Washington, D.C. So he finishes the speech just hours before he'll actually deliver it. I always think it's ir ironic that school children have to memorize the speech because Lincoln didn't. He actually read it. He hadn't memorized his own speech. Um, and yet we we often have to do that. So what did it look like at the moment when he delivered the speech? Um, Joseph Gilbert of the Associated Press was there. And this is how Gilbert described the scene. Gilbert says he stood for a moment with hands clasped and head bowed in an attitude of mourning, a personification of the sorrow and sympathy of the nation, adjusting his old fashioned spectacles, a pair with arms reaching to his temples. He produced from a pocket of his Prince Albert coat several sheets of paper from which he read slowly and feelingly. His marvelous voice, careering in fullness of utterance and clearness of tone, was perfectly audible on the outskirts of the crowd. He made no gestures, nor attempts at display, and none were needed. Now, there's a lot of debate as to whether there was applause when Lincoln finished. If you read Gilbert's account from the Associated Press, he has five breaks for applause throughout, and then the notation that there was long continued applause at the end. But after the turn of the century in the early 1900s, Gilbert was giving a speech before the shorthand re uh, reporters Association. And he said, eh, I, I just I added those in to be polite. There actually wasn't any applause at the end, uh, which is fascinating. And it kind of makes sense, though, when you think about it, this is a funeral oration that Lincoln is is delivering. I mean, is it appropriate to applaud throughout the course of it? Uh, there was a nine year old boy named Charles Baum who was sitting on the, the steps to the platform. And in the 1930s, would write an account and would actually have it notarized. It was kind of an inheritance almost. He was leaving behind to um, to his children. And Baum would say that the speech was met with profound silence followed by hearty applause. And that's an interesting way to think about it as well, both maybe in the short as well as in the long term. So what is the reaction to the speech as we start to move out and the way that you can find that in the 1860s is really through newspapers, um, more so than than anything else. Um, you know, the handful of people that were there were generally more interested in the event as a whole than, you know, specific reactions other than just uh, the president spoke. It was great. You know, there wasn't really anything substantial in the accounts that I've seen anyway of the folks that were there. But you do see editorials that will arise in these different newspapers. And so I took a, an approach of looking at four critical cities. The first is New York. Um, it was the center of news then, it's arguably the center of news now. Um, and New York is where you have all the daily papers. New York is where the AP is located. And it really determines much of how the what the rest of the nation would see when it came to the Gettysburg Address. The second city was Gettysburg itself. There were three local papers in Gettysburg at the time. Um, and what did the local folks have to say? The third was Richmond. Um, Richmond had five, five papers that were publishing on a weekly or even daily basis at that moment, um, and they certainly had things to say. And then last of all, um, foreign. And so looking at London and what did the papers in London and, and Britain writ large sort of have to say about the speech. Um, starting with New York, um, New York really focuses not on Abraham Lincoln. They focus on the man who preceded him, Edward Everett, who delivered an almost two-hour oration before Lincoln got up there. Um, there's not much commentary on Lincoln, and what little appears is quite partisan. Um, I'll say that what they wrote about Everett was pretty partisan as well. Everett is from Boston, and Boston and New York then and now uh, are, are sort of big rivals. It's maybe more sports now than anything else. And they consistently referred to Edward Everett of boasting Massachusetts. That's how they they sort of described it. And so the New York papers have actually very little to say specifically about the Gettysburg Address. Um, the Gettysburg papers had an awful lot to say about the event writ large, um, but they didn't say all that much that was sort of context based around Lincoln's particular words. What's interesting is even the Democratic editors in Gettysburg are nice to Lincoln, which they typically were not. But given that this event had occurred in their town, and as one of the papers would say about 30 or 40 years later, tourism would eventually become the goose that lays the golden egg for Gettysburg. And I think even early on, there's a reluctance from some of the opposition press to sort of sully their town, right, to, to downplay 
the speech that Lincoln gave there because they don't want to they don't want to hurt the town. And so they, you know, just say sort of a few fairly straightforward things, but not all that much. It's in Richmond where it gets really interesting. Um, we know that the New York Herald of November 20th, which carried the full text of the Gettysburg Address, as well as about four pages of coverage of the dedication ceremonies writ large, Edward Everett's speech and others that the Richmond papers have that by the night of November 23rd. And it's remarkable how fast that news, those physical papers were traveling through enemy lines and, and reaching Richmond. And the very next day, the Richmond Daily Dispatch would write that the day's news was not of much interest, right? So they, they actually read this. They read the account. There is direct evidence of that. And they said that what happened in Gettysburg was not of much interest. Uh, a few days later, the Richmond Examiner on November 28th would write in regards to these ceremonies, the Yankees have an invincible conviction that they are the successors of the Romans in empire and of the Athenians in genius. Kings are usually made to speak in the magniloquent language supposed to be suited to their elevated position. On the present occasion, Lincoln acted the clown. Biting. And then you have the Richmond Enquirer on that same day. And they say this, after the order of the day, President Pericles, or rather Abe, made the dedicatory speech, but had to limit his observations within small compass, lest he should tell some funny story over the graves of the immortals. That seems to be a reaction more to the quick little words Lincoln had said on the night of November 18th than on the 19th. What's interesting is that the Richmond papers have the words. They have the text of the Gettysburg Address. And they are refusing to provide it for their people. In fact, when I looked at um, every extant paper I could find in the South during this time period, 1863, there's only one paper out of Lynchburg that would publish any of the words of the Gettysburg Address. This one Lynchburg paper published half a line from the speech, and that's it. They have basically censored the words, and we know that they had them. They're in the New York Herald where they're drawing other accounts from. So why would they do that? Well, Lincoln has talked about equality, and that certainly is not an idea that they can get on board with. But the challenge they have is that he's quoted Thomas Jefferson. He's quoted the Declaration of Independence. And so they can't say, oh, this guy said all this stuff and it's just ludicrous because they're then disavowing Thomas Jefferson. And so Lincoln, I don't think Lincoln necessarily planned this, but Lincoln has sort of caught them in this trap where – you know, they can't abide by his words, but they can't disavow him either. So what do they do? They censor him. They say they're silly. Um, they say he's clownish and they don't actually put the words before the people. Something similar happens in London. Um, the London papers will have the text of the Gettysburg Address by December 1st. So again, very quick. This is only, you know, 11 days after it's been delivered. But what they focus on are the comments of Edward Everett. So they know Everett well. Edward Everett had been ambassador to Great Britain. Edward Everett had been secretary of state for a little while before the Civil War. And in his two-hour speech, Everett had talked about the causes of the war, the um, course of the war thus far. And he had made a comment in that speech that England was littering the sea with pirates, that they are allowing the Confederates to build these warships that were then attacking um, American ships and that they were engaging in or they were allowing people to engage in piracy. That draws a strong response from the London papers. But they almost ignore Abraham Lincoln. You know, they mention that he's there. They, they print the text of the speech, but they largely ignore it. But then again, I wonder if that's because Lincoln has invoked the Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence from who? From them, from Britain. And so he, by using this, by quoting that line from Jefferson, by quoting the Declaration of Independence, he sort of made it where both Richmond and London can't really engage with the words without opening sort of this, this can of worms. Uh, Ronald Reed um, looked at, back in the 1960s, looked at 260 Northern newspapers for their reactions to the Gettysburg Address. And what he found was that 98% of the dailies covered the event. 56% of the weeklies offered some, some coverage as well. And overall, about 85% of the nation's newspapers carried the text of the Gettysburg Address. The words were before the people within just a couple of weeks in the aftermath. When we start to move beyond this initial era, um, and, and one 
you know, sort of short term thing to look at are the funeral eulogies that are preached for Lincoln after he was assassinated in 1865. And what I was struck by in looking at those was just how many of those fun funeral eulogies would quote a line or two of the Gettysburg Address, and they wouldn't say this is from the Gettysburg Address because they knew that the people would recognize it. And it tells us that the words were already before the people, were well known to the people, even just 18 months after the speech had actually been delivered. As we move into sort of uses of it in, in the aftermath here, you see a couple of, of examples. Um, this is a, a Thomas Nast um, comic um, cartoon, I guess we would call it, um, from 1879. It's a protest against um, home rule in the South, right? It's a protest against um, the, the Black Codes that we would see, kind of the precursors to the Jim Crow laws. And you see this line on the right side of the page and this question that's being asked, um, which is, is a government of the people, for the people, and by the people to be shot to death? You know, this idea of what does democracy mean in an era when there is incredible violence against African-Americans? Um, you see some of the, you know, again, these uses of the speech to point out, starting here, some of the flaws that we see as well. But the way that you mostly see it as you move into the aftermath of the Civil War um, is to try to bring about national unity. And that's something that really intensifies during this time period as well, especially as we start to head towards um, the the World War One and the outbreak of, of World War Two as well. In 1906, a woman named Mary Raymond Shipman Andrews penned a short story called The Perfect Tribute. Um, it is the uh, probably most influential Gettysburg Address piece ever written, widest circulated of all time. Um, that book would eventually be printed and sell over 500,000 copies, half a million copies. So what is what is her intent? She's an Alabama native, but she's married a man from New York. And moving in this era when there's still a lot of sectional strife, she is trying to think about a reconciliationist narrative. And so she comes up with this sort of fiction story. She has Lincoln deliver the Gettysburg Address. Um, at the end, he doesn't think that it's gone well. Um, he returns to Washington and he's kind of frustrated. He goes the next day to a hospital where there are some wounded Confederates and there's one man who's been blinded by his wounds, doesn't know who Lincoln is. And he just thinks that Lincoln is a kindly, you know, kind of older man, a lawyer who's walking around. And the guy says, well, let me let me tell you the words of the president yesterday, because they were so impactful. They'll live on. School children will be learning this 50 years from now. And it's this Southern man that convinces Lincoln that he hasn't failed. Now, of course, this is all just completely made up. Um, but this becomes one of the more dominant narratives that we would see all the way up until the 1960s. In fact, if you've ever heard the story that Lincoln penned the Gettysburg Address on the back of an envelope on a train on the way to Gettysburg, it came from Mary Raymond Shipman Andrews. That's part of the, you know, the story that she has constructed here. But it gives you a sense of just how pervasive this story ultimately would become. But her intent is to do something to try to pull the different sections of the country back together. And she certainly is not the only one during this time period. In 1913, Woodrow Wilson came to Gettysburg on July 4th, 1913. And he said during his speech that day, how wholesome and healing the peace has been. We have found one another again as brothers and comrades in arms, enemies no longer, generous friends rather, our battles long past, the quarrel forgotten. Sounds great. It's not true at all, of course, right? There still is incredible sectional strife at that time period, and some would point it out. Um, the Baltimore Afro-American ledger would write the next day, uh, they would sort of pose a, a question as to, quote, whether Mr. Lincoln had the slightest idea in his mind that the time would ever come when the people of this country would come to the conclusion that by the people, he meant only white people. And so you're starting to see the Gettysburg Address used to try to pull the country together, but then at the same time used by other folks to point out some of the flaws in the nation as well. And so you see these sort of, uh, I call it in my book, the narrative and the counter narrative, right? Sort of the, the ways the dominant majority perhaps is using the Gettysburg Address and then the way that it's being used by, by other folks at the same time. Ironically, the black press was joined in their questioning of the uses of the Gettysburg Address by lost cause devotees as well, though. 
Um, Southern woman Mildred Ruffid, Rutherford wrote uh, in a book called The South Must Have Her Rightful Place in History in 1923 um, that Lincoln's biographers pose him as a highly educated literary personage. And the Gettysburg speech, which Seward wrote afterwards, is put into every collection of great speeches and attributed to Lincoln, not Seward. So strange bedfellows that you have here, right? The Baltimore Afro-American ledger and Mildred Rutherford and, and her view. Um, but this broader idea that, that most folks are pushing that time of, of unity, right, of reunification, you see it played out on the Lincoln Memorial that was created and dedicated in 1922. That memorial, which has the text of the Gettysburg Address etched on its walls, says, in this temple, right above Lincoln's head, says, in this temple, as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the union, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. Nothing about equality, nothing about the end of slavery, just simply saving of the union. The author of that phrase wrote, by emphasizing his saving the union, you appeal to both sections. By saying nothing about slavery, you avoid the rubbing of old sores. So during this era, almost all the invocations you see of the Gettysburg Address are about national unity. And little would differ during the World Wars, not surprisingly. This is an example of a war poster that's created to encourage people to buy liberty bonds in 1917. And in fact, in June of that year, as the first Americans arrived in France, the Times of London observed the men in these ships and the millions they left behind them know well what is the cause for which they are ready to sacrifice their all. They are fighting that this world under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. And for that cause, they will fight to the death. Well, that's what the Times was hoping anyway, right, for the, for the assistance that the American soldiers would provide. From 1914 to 1918, during World War I, and then 1939 to 1945, during World War II, the Gettysburg Address was evoked more often and for greater purpose than ever before. As the Times editorial suggests, these invocations really took three main forms. The first, and you see displayed on the screen here, is to encourage Americans to sacrifice their bodies and their pocketbooks in defense of Lincoln's nation. The second use of it is to explain to international audiences why the United States had joined the Allies, this defense of, of democracy. And the third use of it is coming from the other directions. Foreign nations would use the Gettysburg Address to make common cause with the United States, to claim sort of a shared inheritance. And Britain does this constantly throughout the 1913-1914 era to show an appreciation of the ideals, the values that America stands for. The Gettysburg Address during this period is far-reaching but limited at the same time. The Gettysburg Address becomes global really during this particular era, but it's only about democracy. It has completely downplayed the role of equality in this vision that Lincoln had as well. So again, far-reaching but sort of limited. One of the fascinating examples from this general era, though it goes past it just a little bit to the beginning of the Civil War, um, is this stamp. So in 1950, the Crusade for Freedom would present to the people of West Berlin a Liberty Bell to honor their fight against the institution of communism. So it's a Liberty Bell that is meant to be a replica of the bell in Philadelphia, but they added a line from the Gettysburg Address to it. And you can see it portrayed on the stamp, a new birth of freedom. So it is pulling together both of those things. And then in 1951, West Berlin would turn this into a, a stamp, and that's what you now see on the screen. The irony is that this stamp, this denomination, just 10 years earlier, had carried the image of Adolf Hitler. And so they are literally replacing totalitarianism, replacing Hitler with the ideals found in the Gettysburg Address. This really fits into a theme from this general era, um, era of the Cold War. Um, when Eisenhower came into the presidency in the early 1950s, um, he was very concerned about uh, the story that was being told to the world about what America stood for. And one of the agencies that Eisenhower really sort of boosted during this time period was the U.S. Information Agency or Service, depending on um, the time period we're talking about. And, and by decade's end, it would have a, a budget of $100 million a year 
with that motto, telling America's story to the world. But in the late 1950s, it's not always a great story to tell to the world. Um, this is the era of Emmett Till. This is Little Rock. Um, and so what, what does America stand for? In Japan, one man asked, if Americans can regard Negroes as inferior, how do you think they really regard Asians? And that is a huge foreign policy problem. So how do you get around that? Eisenhower thinks one way that you get around it is by bringing the focus to Abraham Lincoln. And in 1957, he authorizes the appointment of an Abraham Lincoln Sesquicentennial Commission that will organize activities both domestically and abroad to bring um, to bring Abraham Lincoln to prominence, to try to use Lincoln as a tool to win the Cold War. The Gettysburg Address plays a massive part in that. Um, they, uh, the U.S. Information Service, along with the State Department, would create these translations of the Gettysburg Address into a variety of, of different languages. This is the Vietnamese translation, but there are Chinese translations. There are, are dozens of them, um, and they produced 50,000 copies of this. And anybody, any foreign dignitaries that came to the United States, any sort of exchange programs, they would leave with a copy of the Gettysburg Address in their native language and go home with that. Going even a step further, in 1959, the U.S. Information Service, along with the Abraham Lincoln Birth Sesquicentennial Commission, created a comic book on the life of Abraham Lincoln. It's about 35 pages long. It has on the inside cover the complete text of the Gettysburg Address. It talks about when they get to the right spot here, that's what you see on the screen, it talks about the Gettysburg Address is that which so classically expresses the American ideal. And then at the very end, they have a depiction of the Lincoln Memorial, but it's um, shown in such a way that you can actually see a few of the words of the Gettysburg Address on the side. This comic book is translated into a dozen languages of Southeast Asia, um, and they send out these copies in um, the fall of, of 1959. They send out 100,000 copies. They send 30,000 to Saigon, Vietnam. They are literally trying to stop the dominoes from falling by reminding people of what a government should look like. The government that Lincoln defined in Gettysburg, in the address, that is what people should believe in. And then you have this, maybe the most massive dispersal of the ideals of the Gettysburg Address of all time. Um, if you sent mail abroad in the early 1960s, you reminded people of what their government should look like. It should be government of, by, and for the people. And then if you look inside that U on the top line, you see a bomber, and they reminded people perhaps of what the consequences would be if people didn't believe in that type of government. I always think this is such a fascinating kind of mixed message that we have here as well. So we've seen a lot that's coming out from the United States, but some of it was coming back from the other direction as well. This is an example of a stamp that was produced from a foreign country um, in 1959, 90 of the 120 countries around the world would celebrate Lincoln's birth in some way or another. This is a stamp series, one of six that was produced by Honduras. And this one in particular is depicting the moment when Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address. Um, we have to take it with a grain of salt because during this era, during the 1950s and the 1960s, the United States provided about $120 million worth of military aid to Honduras. Um, this is at a time when their GDP in a given year was about 335 million. So it's a substantial sum that's being provided. You know, is there a reason that they have for producing this stamp? We could say the same of Taiwan. Um, this is a stamp that Taiwan produces in 1959 as well. And what you see on the right is Lincoln, government of, by, and for the people. What you see on the left is Sun Yat Sun. This is the founder of modern China in 1911, helped lead the overthrow of the dynasties. In 1912, wrote what we would call a constitution, the three principles of the people, nationalism, sovereignty, and democracy. Those ideals came from the Gettysburg Address, government of, by, and for the people. He says this explicitly in his autobiography that that, that is where he came up with, with these particular ideas. Taiwan at that time, again, another nation that has reason for trying to cement these ties with the United States, but nonetheless, we are seeing these come back in um, from, from the other direction. When we think about the late 50s and the early 60s, the incidents that are paramount in the mind of Americans 
the U-2 incident, the Berlin Wall, um, the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Missile Crisis, that is really what people are thinking about. And in that context, in a context where it's the, civil, the Cold War that is reigning supreme, thinking about the message of democracy that comes from the Gettysburg Address makes a lot of sense. But slowly, 1961, 62, 63, um, that focus starts to shift. It gives way to concern about violence at home, particularly on the heels of the children's protest in Birmingham, Alabama, the murder of Medgar Evers in Mississippi, and the tide starts to shift. Memorial Day 1963 brings Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson to Gettysburg. And in his speech that day, Johnson started with the Cold War theme. He said, until the world knows no aggressors, until the arms of tyranny have been laid down, until freedom has risen up in every land, we shall maintain our vigil to make sure our sons who died on foreign fields shall not have died in vain. But then he shifts tones. He says, 100 years ago, the slave was free. 100 years later, the Negro remains in bondage to the color of his skin. The Negro today asks justice. Finally, Johnson noted the place of the Gettysburg Address in the National Pantheon. He said, our nation found its soul in honor on these fields of Gettysburg 100 years ago. We must not lose that soul in dishonor now on the fields of hate. This marks a turning moment, a turning moment when people aren't just talking about the Gettysburg Address in terms of democracy anymore, but in terms of equality as well. It's a turning point that we see further that November during the centennial celebrations of the Gettysburg Address that were held when Secretary of State Dean Rusk would actually travel to Gettysburg. And he offered a clear analysis of the importance of the speech then and in the 1960s. Rusk said this, the central commitments of the American experiment are probably known to more people in other lands through the words of the Gettysburg Address than through those of the Declaration of Independence. He continued, our commitments to freedom are the source of our foreign policy. They explain also our concern about our failures here at home to live up fully to our own great commitments. The rest of the world is watching closely the struggle for full equality in this country. Our failures distress our friends and hearten our enemies. And so this is the period, I argue, when the full meaning of the Gettysburg Address is recaptured. It had been lost for 100 years. When Lincoln went to Gettysburg, his argument was that equality was central to the Union. That if you wanted the union to persist, you had to have equality at its core. When you look at the Cold War era, um, equality has become central to winning the Cold War as well. The lack of equality, the terrible race relations in the 1950s and the 1960s were something that the Soviets were using to encourage people in other nations not to ally with the United States, but to ally with them instead. And so finally, in late 1962, shifting into 1963, you start to have the recapture of Lincoln's intentional or original message. He meant the Gettysburg Address to be his most eloquent statement that democracy could only persist with equality at its core. And after a century, the message finally seemed to get through. So with that, I'm going to pause and throw it open to any questions that you all may have.